Él es Lou Rosenfeld, es editor y fundador de Rosenfeld Media y coautor de Information Architecture for the Web and Beyond. En Rosenfeld Media, él ha publicado docenas de libros de UX y es curador de las conferencias Enterprise Experience y Design Ops Summit. Un aplauso para él. Thank you. You call me the anti-Nick Fink, although I love Nick Fink. Um, tengo una historia. Es una historia es la verdad. Juan Madrigal puede leer mente. Es la verdad, porque hace dos o tres meses yo estaba pensando que, oh, quiero, uh, uh, I want to do a presentation. <laughs> Una presentación. Y, ¿dónde? En uh, Colombia. Y si uh, Colombia, Medellín. Hey, yo no sabe de Tila. Y uh, de, después, una, una uh, o dos semanas, Juan Madrigal mandó mí un email. Hey, Luis, ¿quieres uh, ir a Medellín para una presentación? Es amazing. He did it. He read my mind. <laughs> y estoy aquí. Es mi primera vez en Colombia hace 38 años. Ok, momento, una cosa más. Esas personas son el equipo de la produ 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 production de esta conferencia, saben. Y um, yo quiero que ellos uh, levantante, se levantan, por favor. Y los voluntarios, por favor. Everybody, everybody stand up. Ellos son los héroes de esta industria. Es muy difícil que pr 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 produce a conferencia. Muchas gracias. Abrigado. Okay, English now. <laughs> Boy, that was hard. Um, thank you for having me here. This has really been a wonderful time for me. Um, I cannot believe... No, I can, because I've been to another ILA in Recife six years ago. That was a great event, too. And I know some of you were there. I've met some of you again. It was a wonderful event, as is this. And the, the production here is incredible. And to pull this off in three languages makes my conference producer's mind explode. I don't know how they do it. So um, I'm, I'm grateful to be here. I really did want to come to Medellin. I'm not making that story up. Juan really did read my mind. And I still don't know how he did that. Thank you, Juan. Um, I'm going to talk about a really simple topic, something that <laughs> we all deal with all the time, namely time. Actually, I'm kind of an idiot, because this is the first time I've given this talk, and the subject of time is actually deceptive. It's probably the hardest thing I've ever tried to present on. So here goes. Okay. We, as humans, are bad at dealing with time. I want the person in the audience who thinks he or she is really, really good at dealing with time to raise their hand. Yeah, I didn't think so. I don't see a single hand going up. And by time, I don't just mean being late. Oh, by the way, uh, Jose Coronado told me all about Colombian time. <laughs> I got news for you. You're not special, Colombia. We, we're, it's a human thing. We're not only always late, but we're just bad at 
sort of navigating the concept of time. And it's a big issue for us as humans and for us as designers. I'll get to the designer part a little later, but let me indulge me for a bit and let me talk about humans. Part of the problems we have with time is that we have to combine time with space. So, things are moving in time and things are moving in space concurrently. And that's why I have so much respect for people who do uh, naval artillery. You have someone on a moving thing shooting a moving thing at a moving thing, which is amazing. And think about in the old days before computers, how they did the, the real-time calculus. I don't know how they did it. Humans are amazing. The fact that they could hit a battleship with another missile is remarkable. But we're still bad with time. We're really bad at understanding the past. We're not good at remembering. You know people, you're probably married to one, or you're the child of one, or one is your child. You have someone close to you who is terrible at remembering things. Or you may not admit it, but you are terrible at remembering things. We have a very poor command of the past. Those of us who experience the same event in the past experience it in different ways. Or our own memories of the same event changes over time. We're awful at dealing with the past, and we're even worse at dealing with the future. And we need to know something about the future, right? We want to make reasonable predictions so that we understand what we should do, we can understand what risks we can take, and so on. And there's actually tools that are out there that help us, like probabilistic thinking, which enables predictive analytics. You guys all do predictive analytics, right? You don't. Of course not. It's pretty hard. The human mind has a hard time grasping things like probability in the first place. But it's even the simpler stuff, like just seeing evidence of what might happen, that's really difficult. So sometimes the future sends us a message. And we're not very good at picking up on that message. So, for example, and I hate to bring it up, but climate change, the climate crisis, we're getting a message. There is evidence, but we're not very good at paying attention to it. One of the reasons is that humans are driven by story. We will take a good story over evidence any day. Uh, you, uh, Yuval Noah Harari, uh, if you've read his great book, uh, Sapiens, I'm certain it's been translated into both Portuguese and, and Spanish. He dedicates the beginning of the book to explaining why humans, why homo sapiens, beat out the other humanoid species. Neanderthals, Denisovans, and others. And the reason is that we are good at telling stories, making up stories, and understanding stories. In fact, we're so good that we found as humans that stories unite us into bigger groups, bigger clans, even religions. And that's what enabled us to beat out all those other humanoids and take over the planet. So we like stories. I'm gonna tell you a story you, do you guys, are any of you old enough to remember these guys? Yell it out. Come on, headbangers. Van Halen. There's Eddie in the center doing his thing and David Lee Roth doing his thing. And um, these guys were a really popular rock band uh, based in California originally in the uh, late 70s to the roughly mid 80s. One of the early hair bands. That's not so important. What's important is the story. The story, you may have heard, is about the brown M&Ms. Uh, I, I should check my cultural baggage for a moment and just tell you that, if you don't know, M&Ms are a candy, a chocolate candy, very popular in the States, maybe here too. Or do we have M&Ms? Are they big here in Columbia? All right, good. I haven't seen one, and I'm very disappointed. And there were no brown M&Ms in the speaker room, which is a good thing, by the way. And these guys thought that was a good thing, too. Because if you look at the legal agreement that they had with their conference venues, they famously said, 
M&Ms. And look at this, in all caps and underline, this is like the pinnacle of typesetting technology at the time. Warning, absolutely no brown ones. How many, I'm just curious, how many of you are familiar with this story? Hands, all right. So, these guys, what a bunch of prima donnas. They, seriously? You're gonna make some poor assistant, assistant intern go through all the bags of M&Ms and pull out the brown ones? What a bunch of jerks, total jerks. And that's a good story, right? Because the truth of the matter is, these guys were really astute business people. They didn't really care about the brown M&Ms. What they cared about was their own safety and their own ability to perform in the way they needed to as professionals, which was covered in their legal agreement. They were very specific about things, and so they put this information in their agreement as an Easter egg of sorts. So when they would get to the dressing room at the venue, they would go right to the bowl of M&Ms, and if they saw brown ones, they knew that the venue wasn't paying attention to their needs and their requirements. And so they went out and looked at all the other more important things that were specified in the agreement and knew that they might have a problem on their hands that might lead to an unsafe situation. Because, you know, when you're flying over the stage like these guys did, maybe the rope's kind of a weak, maybe it's not up to specifications, and you fall and you, you break your chin or you die. So they're pretty smart, but we don't choose to believe that about them. We just choose to believe the story that we already have, that these rock and rollers are a bunch of arrogant prima donna jerks. So we have this natural desire, it's a human thing, to emphasize story over facts, and that leads us into some bad problems. The problems are that we struggle with time, we can't really stretch it out in a way that we can see the big picture of time very easily. We get tripped up by the space aspects of time, how everything is moving at the same time, and then we double down on moments. What's a moment? Just a little package. A little package of time and memory that when we are feeling scared or confused, or powerless, we try to make sense of our reality. And we remember that once we do make sense, that's a moment. And so we break our past into these moments and they're digestible. And when you're experiencing them, they're clear and, and they make sense. But when you pour the milk in, they get soggy very quickly. That's the problem. They don't really do what you want them to do. They don't line up in a nice, logical order. We can't put those moments together in ways to tell truth very easily, to tell the story that's meaningful. So um, I want to dig a little bit more into this weird concept of moments. Indulge me for a little longer. And I'm going to do it by bringing up my favorite author. That's Kurt Vonnegut. He was maybe uh, one of the, the most famous, influential authors in the US in the 20th century. And he wrote his most famous book, Slaughterhouse Five, based largely on his personal experiences as a prisoner of war during World War II. Now, it's a fictionalized story. It's loosely based on his experiences. But the main character is named Billy Pilgrim. Billy Pilgrim, the book starts out, has become unstuck in time. What does that mean? Well, Billy experiences moments in a non-sequential way, from his childhood to being a prisoner of war in Dresden to, um, this is an interesting one, being um, with a, uh, a beautiful actress, I won't tell you what type of actress, pulled from Earth and put in a zoo for humans on the planet Tralfamador. So uh, Billy and uh, Montana Wildhack, his girlfriend, get to hang out in the zoo they were placed in by the aliens from the planet Tralfamador. I bet you didn't know we were going to talk about Tralfamador in this talk. So Billy even experiences moments like his own death when he's giving a speech 
to uh, a whole audience like this one. And oh my God, he says, I'm about to be assassinated. Goodbye, hello, goodbye. And he gets shot right at that moment. But these things happen in a random way. He travels from his time as a prisoner of war to his time on Tralfamador, to his childhood, to his death and back again in a way he has no control over. And I bring this up because I want to contrast it with us being stuck in time. We're not like Billy. We experienced moments in a different way. We have a very hard time grasping the passage of time. And again, that means we double down on the little things of time, those moments. And when we do that, we have a very limited view of time, of the past, of what the future could be. And because it's so limited and because we have nothing else to sort of make sense of time, and we double down on those moments, they become stale. They become soggy. They start being valuable, stop being valuable for us. In fact, they become prisons for us. And that's my concern, especially in our field, that we struggle with things like definitions of our practices, of our tribes, of metaphors that we use to describe what we do that are based on moments that are very, very rapidly out of date and not just useless, but harmful. And my message today is to encourage us to start thinking beyond the prisons of the moments that we create for ourselves. So let's start, I'm gonna cover two topics. Now, you know, not only am I like you, a, a, a UXE person of one sort or another, but I'm also a, a, an author and a publisher. I'm very interested in words. And I know that you're mostly non-native English speakers. So, um, Obrigado y uh, gracias of the to the translators. Thank you very much. Um, and yes, please. I also, uh, I'll put a URL up at the end um, of the translations of the article that is the basis for this talk. I've had it translated both into Spanish and Portuguese. I'll talk a little bit about that at the end. So I'm gonna cover two concepts, definitions, and metaphors. Let's start with definitions, which really, really get us into a lot of trouble. I'm going to tell you a story about writing this book. So I started with Peter Morville writing this book in 1996. And um, it was a time when people involved with the web typically had the title webmaster. And they were finding it was an awful title. It didn't really describe what many of them did. Are there any webmasters in the room? A couple hands out of uh, 1,300, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but I'll bet you wear other hats as well. You have other titles or job roles that, that you use. In 1998, people were struggling, especially people who were dealing with information problems. And these were people coming from many different backgrounds, developers, usability people, psychologists, art artists and designers, visual designers. And they didn't really have the right language or the right terminology to talk about information problems. Oh, by the way, librarians too, I shouldn't forget them. So, um, Peter and I write the book. I don't think it's a great book. I really don't, it's a good book, but it goes crazy. And it's in a fourth edition now, and it sold something like 250,000 copies. And I can't believe it. I really can't, but what I, do believe is that it had good timing and that it was a good moment. It basically took a term, information architecture, that we borrowed and tried to interpret for the multidimensional space of the internet, of the web in particular, and that did something for people. It gave them a common language, a common framework, and a common job title, and suddenly, not everyone, but a lot of people, especially people who used to be webmasters, now had a new title that they liked, and it was information architect. Well, that was great for a little while. And if you were around back then, you might remember that there was some big battles going on. Just a year later, they broke out. The skirmishes turned into big battles, maybe even a war, 
and we called it big IA versus little IA. Does anybody remember that? Help me out. A couple hands go up. Yeah, I know, you're old too. <laughs> so, suddenly people were fighting. They were, the big I people were saying, well, you know, there's all these other areas of experience and, and systems and, you know, the definition of IA that we were working with today doesn't work. And then there were the little IA people saying, yeah, but we've got to go deeper into metadata and taxonomies and navigation and search. And there's a whole bunch of work to be done there. And why do we need to like expand at the same time? So there was a lot of fighting about this definition. And we used to call it DT, DT, which stood for, or still does, defining the damn thing. And friendships ended over defining the damn thing. What a colossal waste of time. All because we created, without realizing it, a moment prison. The moment prison of the term information architect and information architecture. It was great for like a year, and that's fine, but it didn't have to go further. When it stopped being useful, or when it started being more negative than positive, we should have stepped back and thought about new types of definitions. And by the way, eventually we did. A lot of the big IA people are now probably thinking of themselves as UX people, maybe service designers, and the little IA people, some of them are still information architects, some of them became content strategists, content modelers, and so on. It's all good, but we didn't have to have all those fights. We wasted a lot of energy on those fights. Okay, so stay with me for history for a little while. So people would come to me and say, Lou, we keep hearing that IA is dead. Oh, yeah. IA is dead. Okay. Well, you know, that's okay. Um, you know, I don't know. It wasn't really okay. It did kind of grate me just a little bit because it just seemed kind of odd. IA was dead. But here's what we were doing. The people who felt like IA was dead... And I hear this still. They say, you never hear the job title information architect anymore. Nobody's hiring information architects. Ergo, IA is dead. And you look at the numbers from Google Trends going back to 2004, and you could be forgiven for thinking that IA is dead. You'd be wrong, but you could be forgiven. So, who killed us? The evil interaction designers. And if you look at what happens with interaction design as a title, it's got like the same trajectory <laughs> since 2004. It doesn't look so good either. Who's taking their jobs? Who's taking all of our jobs? Oh, well, it's the terrible product designers. <laughs> They're actually growing. It's a very smart guy with a very difficult name, Kenneth Bowles. Kenneth Bowles, that's actually how you pronounce it. He says, when a job becomes an identity, you're in serious trouble. He's absolutely right. Because a job title is a moment prison. A job title masks all kinds of important things behind it. And creates problems that divert our attention and our energy in bad ways. When our attention and our energy is limited and needed for more important things. So I want to talk a little bit about these definitions that are moment prisons. So I want you to look at this list and while you're looking at it, ask yourself, what's missing? So are you your job title? I sure as hell hope not. Your value is much more than your job title suggests. Your portfolio, that doesn't really represent your work. Your resume does not represent you and your career. A job posting, if you're hiring, is not a very good representation of the work you need done. And an RFP sure as hell is a terrible representation of a project need in most cases. A degree is a lousy portrayal of your education. Your, a, a, a toolkit of methods, you know, we, we, we name these methods in ways that sound so important, but... Often we're doing things that wouldn't necessarily be classified as methods, and yet they're just as important, if not more so. 
Your discipline is not necessarily the approach you take, and your tribe is not necessarily your people. I love that Josh Seiden had to bring up yesterday in his fantastic talk that this is an interaction design conference. It might have actually sort of been surprising for some of you or not important for some of you, and that's okay. Because for those people, it doesn't really matter about the tribe, the people are the people. And you're post-tribal, and, and hats off to you. So let's dig into one of these, job titles. I'm going to suggest that with any of these moment prisons, you take them and you try to spread them out over time to see if you can tell the story. So these are job titles that I've had. I was a custodian in high school and a warehouse worker in a furniture warehouse. Later, I was a furniture sales associate. Then I got education, and then I didn't know what to do, and then I had to get more education, and I became a librarian. And uh, all kinds of cool things were happening with technology in 1988 or 90 or whatever it was. And so I became an information technologist. I was the guy, that's a fancy name for the guy who was like putting the wires under the tiles and the, the ceiling and the drop ceiling. That's what I did. And then uh, I put librarian and information technologist together to become an information architect. But then I wanted to hang out with the really cool kids. And I started uh, being a, a user experience designer, and then I got insane, and I became a publisher. But that's a story based on job titles. That is a story. That has meaning. The titles themselves, not so much. Together, they have meaning. When you look at these moment prisons over time, then things get interesting. Can you look at portfolios over time? How about job descriptions? If you're hiring, what about this as an exercise? Let's say you're hiring for a particular position and you take the job descriptions for that position that you've had over the last five years. And you print them out and you put them in a stack. You sit down with your applicants for that position and you show them the progression of changes to the job description for that position over the past five years. Or maybe better, you ask them if they can see what's changed and where things might be going in the future because they're part of that future. So taking these various definitions and spreading them out over time tells some interesting stories. Again, I'm not saying you shouldn't have job titles or job descriptions, but what you're doing is you are planting a flag that has limited utility. And you look at the world, and that's what happens is things change under your feet, literally. Amundsen, when he reached the South Pole, planted a flag. You know, at least the magnetic poles, I learned recently, are moving. So are the main poles, like the South Pole and the North Pole, but the, the magnetic poles are moving something like 2,000 kilometers over the last 200 years. Something that we think of as stable, as the Earth itself, it's changing under our feet, literally. Think of other opportunities for definition, or better yet, better than definition, for defining. So, this conference program is a definition of interaction design. It is a definition. This is the zeitgeist of interaction design as this community and its programmers see it in 2019. That's fascinating. You can say, what is interaction design? This program will tell you. What's even more interesting is to look at it over time. What was the difference between 2017's program and 2018? Maybe there wasn't a big difference. What does that tell us? And what might we expect as we get past this year into future programs? I program now three conferences a year, not only Enterprise Experience and the Design Operations Summit, but our new one is Advancing Research. And we do tons of user research for both, for all of them. And we try to learn about what people want, the demand, and what people want to present on, the supply, and our jobs to put that together. And it's fascinating to see the changes from year to year. It is not the same. There are similar things. There are patterns and trends, but there are major differences as well. I find the same thing 
with publishing books. So when we started signing authors, and actually Donna Spencer was our, our first signing in 2005, <laughs> six. Here it is in the lower right corner, card sorting. We had a book on prototyping as well. We had a lot of books early on, 2008, 2009, that were almost how-to books about methods for doing user experience design and research. And if you look at the books today that we publish, they're far more conceptual, like Dave Gray's Liminal Thinking, or they're far more synthetic, bringing many things together, like orchestrating experiences by Chris Risden and Patrick Quattlebaum, which is a mashup of service design and customer experience and user experience, which in turn are mashups of other things. So the, the, the agenda of publishing has changed for us. And, you know, like sometimes people say, don't you feel like you screwed up at some point? Like you thought it was going to be one thing and then it became another? And I, I just don't understand that. That's like, that's the good thing. It changes. We're, we're taking a stab at defining user experience, just like the conference programmers are and everyone else in this field. But we're not being locked into moment prisons of definitions. So some questions for you to consider before we move on. Can you eliminate definitions? Do you have to define things? And if you are going to define things, can you let them go pretty quickly? Can you recognize that the half-life of a definition is, by definition, very short? And can you try the verb instead of the noun? Can you try defining instead of coming up with definitions? Think of the longitudinal process of defining. And um, can you take definitions as an alternative, like the definition of a job through a job posting and look at those over time. So definitions is moment prisons. I want to go on to metaphors. Metaphors are fire. That's a metaphor. Sorry. It's a little bit meta for. Um, I'm old enough, like a few of you, I won't make you identify yourselves again, um, to remember when people were thinking a lot and spending a lot on things called portals. This, by the way, is, this is history. Uh, here's a portal. This is the Alta Vista portal from about 1997 or six or something. And this is how we used to find our way around the internet. And there was other ones like Excite. Ultimately, you know, Yahoo became the leader. And they organized the web before Google kicked their asses. Um, and we were all very influenced by this sort of view of organizing information for consumers of, of the internet. And then we started building products based on this concept because a lot of people in organizations saw the value of building intranets. But these intranets, they saw them as like the portal of the universe of their company. And so they tried to build portals. And SharePoint is obviously a, a tool that many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with and know that it's used or, for the idea of a sort of gateway to corporate internal information. Now, a portal is a metaphor, and it's a tricky one. I actually had the weird experience of being an expert witness on a $17 million lawsuit that hinged on the 1997 definition of portal. Were these portals or were they not portals? If they were, the lawsuit went one way. If these websites were something else, it went another way. We actually won the suit. But it's not surprising that people in those days were thinking so much about portals because it sounds good. Hey, there's portals out there. We want one too. We got problems. Okay, I used to do this. I used to go in consulting engagements for a good 10 years with my team and then later as an independent consultant. What would happen? The client would say to me, we want a portal. And I'd be like, what does that mean? What is a portal? 
move on a portal. But, but, and it would just go on and on that way. And then finally, I'm slow, but I eventually catch up. I figured out that I would ban the word portal from the conversations that I was having with my clients. And the way I did it is I said, if any of you use the word portal, you got to throw a dollar on the table. And if I do it, it's five dollars. And suddenly things changed. The nature of conversations got at not this idea of portal, which is, by the way, very expensive and not very effective, but the idea of diagnostics. What is the problem? Are there a few little things that we can do to address that problem that don't cost nearly as much and, is, and are far more effective than building the Alta Vista of the corporate internet? And suddenly, things started working very well, and clients became very happy because I saved them a lot of money, and they had a better product. It's because we broke out of the moment prison of the metaphor of portal. There are other types of metaphors that become moment prisons for us, and I'm going to tell you a painful story. It's about the Information Architecture Institute. Some of you know about it, and in fact, some of you are members of the information, anyone here a member of the Information Architecture Institute? I see a few hands go up. Well, you're wrong. Because the Information Architecture Institute is no more. It was a professional association, and now it's no more. It's gone. Why? Well, a bunch of us founded the Information Architecture Institute in, I guess it was 2002, because we felt like information architecture was growing. It was going to be a thing. People entering it needed information so they could become better at doing it. They needed each other to help each other. They needed some way of, of capturing what they knew and enabling communications and community to happen. And that sounded great, and it was a great idea, but it was sort of an ambiguous idea. And very quickly, within a couple of years, it was decided that we needed a model or a metaphor that was more concrete, and that metaphor was professional association. Professional association. Some uh, have pointed out to me that the roots of the professional association model of organizing a community lie in the guild system that comes from the Middle Ages. Okay, nothing wrong with that, but the problem is the 20th century model, the version that we tried to apply to the Information Architecture Institute, was conceived before social media, before cheap digital technology, before relatively inexpensive air travel, all kinds of things that sort of negate the value of a professional association defined by 20th century standards. And worse, a lot of professional associations continue today only because they're woven into academic, academia. And they are woven into the tenure process with their publications and the jury review. And there's nothing wrong with it, but information architects were not academics. So it was an even more troubling model for us to use. It meant that our money was supposed to come from membership dues. That's a really hard story to sell when much information on the internet is already out there and it's free. Why be a member? And this started to choke the IAI. And it was so disappointing because there already were other models. The Interaction Design Association has a much better, more current and more supple model for organizing you. Look, we're here. This is amazing. The IXDA is a, a very foresightful organization. It didn't get caught in the moment prison that the IAI got caught in. <laughs> it did a lot of great things. It really did. And a lot of people worked their asses off and did wonderful things and got to know each other. It was not a failure, but it did cease. 
And I think a lot of it had to do with being a professional association. So let's think about other metaphors for a moment that can be moment prisons for us. Or let's play my favorite game, ban the word. You're going to play along. All right, you ready? All right, I've given you a couple. Let's ban portal, and you see how conversations change. Boy, if we had banned professional association from the conversations we were having in 2004 or 5 or whatever it was, the IAI might still be here today and strong. I'll give you a few others. You can just like go, yeah, or well, no, when I put some of these up. So what do you think? App? Everybody needs an app. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What problem are we trying to? No. Everybody needs an app. We need an app. <laughs> Stand up and take a bow. Yeah. Yeah. Dashboard. That sounds good. A dashboard. I can't wait to get my hands on the dashboard. A dashboard. I know some of you have actually like, got the project handed to you to build the dashboard. And first you were like, what? what? What's it going to do? And then you quietly, when nobody's looking, you start changing it. And the metaphor starts to get swept under the carpet and it's no longer a dashboard. You build something else and you just thank God that nobody noticed that you didn't build a dashboard. How about this one? So, so what would happen if that word went away? Um, how about, um, and, and I, I, Josh is in the audience, Josh Seiden, and he said, this is okay. I can do this, because he said it's a good one. And he said, this is okay, too. What's missing? What's missing? What? Hambot? Canvas. Canvas. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, Hambot? That sounds like something that feeds you before it kills you. Um, okay, uh, Canvas, what else? <laughs> you know, I, I can't hear because I'm a little deaf, but you can hear, so you enjoy this. <laughs> Maybe someone could tweet these out. Take a, make a list and tweet them out so we can all add to it. All right. You get the point. Think about metaphors that you take for granted today that are under your nose and do something with them. Think about what they mean and if they've maybe sort of expired under your nose. So some questions to consider. First of all, what metaphors can you try banning? Just like, go to the next meeting with your leadership and say, you know, Lou said something weird would happen if we ban the term design thinking. If we try it just for 15 minutes, see what happens. See if you can get them to go along. Also, just think about your own metaphors. Like, I think of myself, like, today, the, my metaphor du jour is band leader. That works for me, but it's not going to be the same in a year, probably. The next time you're sitting in the dentist chair getting your teeth drilled and having unpleasant things done in your mouth, you might as well just go all the way and start thinking about your metaphors and which ones to kill. Maybe you think of yourself as a general contractor and that worked for you for a while, but it's actually not working anymore. And it may be the reason your work's not going so well. So think about the metaphors you use for yourself. Okay, so I just trashed definitions and I trashed metaphors. It's enough trash for the end of what's been actually like the opposite of trash. It's been like this really positive conference experience. So I want to reel it back in and wade into waters that I'm really profoundly unqualified to wade into. Anybody know this? It's the uncertainty principle. So... Uh, I'm going to totally embarrass myself here, but my understanding is that Werner Heisenberg, he might have been actually someone before him, they figured that at the quantum level, 
the stuff of the universe could have two, quant two qualities, two characteristics. The, the stuff of the universe could behave as a particle or as a wave, not both. It could be one thing, it could behave like the other thing. It was both, but it couldn't exhibit those behaviors at the same time. And this is unfortunate because we are already struggling with time. And we are already trying to basically squeeze our concept of time into particles. Those are those moments. And we're losing out because our, maybe our brains are too small or maybe we're not working hard enough at it. But we're losing out on our understanding of the waves. The waves are the things that knit together those particles. They are the, the stories, the narratives, the messy, delicious stuff that we do struggle with and we do pin down from time to time in moments. But we lose sight of the, those narratives, of those stories. And suddenly, we're stuck with moment prisons that we've built around ourselves. So I want us to be thinking not so much about moments, but also momentum. And I think we can have both of these things, even if Heisenberg is rolling over in his grave today. So I want to leave you with that. I want you to see this as a positive, that there are things that you can do by asking some of the questions that I put up here today. So this is actually kind of an oddly practical keynote, and I'm sorry, probably wasn't supposed to be. But I hope I've given you some tools and some understanding to take back with you, to question yourself, to question your colleagues, your teams, your leadership about some of the essential words, definitions, and metaphors that we take for granted and which create moment prisons for us. I wish you luck, and I want to thank you guys one more time. What a wonderful conference, and uh, safe travels back wherever you're going. Thank you so much. I just want to mention the translations as well as the original English version are available from my Medium page. And I want to especially say gracias a Marcela Valencia y Abragado, a Paula Alcevedo Macedo for their help with translation. Thank you so much. Do we have time? I, I believe we have time for a few questions, time and space for a few questions. <laughs> Particles are welcome, but uh, the waves would be better. Anyway, so I know there are mic runners. I guess um, they'll find you because I can't. There's a question over there. Hi. Oh, uh, there's a bunch of questions, so I'll, I'll defer to the mic runners. <laughs> you talk about uh, constantly reviewing uh, useless concepts. And I would like to know what's your opinion on constantly reviewing useful concepts. Like, as a UX designer, sometimes I read um, design articles and it's like, you're not a UX designer anymore, you are a customer experience designer, you're just an experience designer, and so on and so on. So is there a benefit to that? Or so is the question, what do I think about articles that tell you you, you are something different than Excuse you thought me? you were, right? Did, did I, or do you want to restate it one more time? Um, what's your opinion on constantly reviewing useful concepts like renaming and rebranding uh, job titles like user experience designer or customer experience designer and all that? I think we should be reviewing it constantly. That's a big part of my, my feeling here is that we take these things for granted and they just become like muscle memory. Oh, we're going to hire another uh, in interaction designer. Wait a minute, is really an interaction designer that we're gonna hire? Or is it something else? Has something changed? Or should we be changing what we think of as interaction designer? So um, I, I know there are a lot of articles that make you feel bad because they tell you you're something you're not. Or uh, people who try to uh, tell you you're not, really, uh, you're not really an interaction designer because you don't do this. And screw all that, honestly. You know, I mean, I'm not saying definitions have no value, but they have fleeting value. And I just want to encourage people to figure this stuff out on their own, and as much as they can, to see the path over time, to 
to really understand their own story and the stories in our field. Next question. Hi, Lou, here. I was wondering, um, I think also the term architecture is dead, but it's such an important part of our job every day. And maybe now that we have lost the term, people forget to do information architecture before sitting down to design or to write content. How do you feel about that or what do you think um, the past should be for us to be able to change names and leave the metaphors but not leave the concepts that we still need to do our work? That's a great question. If I'll, I'll try to paraphrase it and say that the, like, the term information architecture does seem to have died for many people, but I think you're also suggesting that there's still a, a, a big need. And I totally agree. In fact, um, you're always hearing these statistics that say, in the last three years, more information was created than in the rest of human history combined. Uh, you know, three years, two years, four years, whatever it is, it's stunning. And I don't think machine, uh, artificial intelligence is going to fix all that. It's going to help. You still need humans, as Josh was saying, Josh Clark, to do what they're good at. And I don't think information architecture, because it is so semantic in nature, is going to be easily handled by AI. I mean, it's, it's actually one of the few things that won't be handled by AI. So all you folks, whether you like the term or not, are probably going to be information architects in 20 years or sooner. Um, or you're going to be doing it. So my feeling about the term is I don't care. I used to do consulting engagements where I wouldn't even use the term information architecture because it's like it was a moment prison. I don't care. I just want to solve the problem. Now, the, the, the problem we're seeing now is that people are forgetting that there is practice out there, that there's experience, that there's knowledge about how to organize information and make it easier to find and understand. And that's, that is a problem. But like anything else, there's going to be people who figure that out, who are curious, who look in the mirror and look at the literature and they understand. And then there's going to be people who reinvent the wheel or don't solve it at all. You know, you can only try to help those folks along. There's no shortage of work for information architecture people or with those skills. It's only going to grow. It's going to be democratized. Just the same is true for interaction design. The same is true for every design practice. So I'm not worried, but I don't care what you call it as long as you do it. Next question. Anyone on this side? I've seen the mic runner. There's a mic runner right there. I don't want to just play favorites to the stage right. Anybody over here? I don't want to see all the same hands, but all right, there's another one over there. Okay. Hello. Is it better? Hello. Uh, I, I want to ask you if you have an info. Uh, uh, I'm nervous. Sorry, people. I'm nervous uh, too, so it's okay. Uh, I've been a designer for like 10 years now, and uh, when I started, uh, we didn't have enough of these canvas or templates, so we are now trapped in the templates moments or maybe the, the design system moments. We, are, we have a lot of jargons we are talking a lot right now. And I wanted to ask you if you have any advice uh, as a more experienced person than me. Not, not telling you old, sorry. <laughs> uh, to keep you updated, like to don't don't get, get crap, trapped in moments. So, specifically, you want me to address design systems? Or just anything that you... Just, just anything, just to keep us right, updated. So, what, here's one thing that's really good. And I think this audience, in my experience, I speak at a lot of different conferences. You are a younger audience than I typically see. And that's really cool, because what I find is your generation of designers is what I would call post-tribal. You're not so bound by the graduate degree you got in college and, and what they told you to study and what conferences they told you to go to. You're not so bound by the chauvinism of methods that you use to do your work. Like the first person I saw who really brought this idea home to me of, of synthesis and not really caring about where things come from, but just doing the work, whatever it took, was Luke Robluski. When he did the web form design book for us, which was a great book, you know, people kind of call it an interaction design book, but I also 
a lot of usability people sort of claim it as their own as well. And, uh, and a lot of visual design people respond to it very positively. And it's because Luke didn't care where things came from. He just said, I, I see how form design is important and I'm gonna commission a usability study for the book from some usability people and uh, but we're going to use that in the interest of interaction design. And he just put it all together and synthesized it in a really elegant way. And I see a lot more people do that as a matter of course without even realizing it. So first of all, you have that to your advantage. What you may not have to your advantage is depth. So I want to remind people of the T-shaped model, if you're not familiar with it. The idea of the T-shaped model is that when it comes to skills, we have to have the breadth, the horizontal piece, so we can work with anyone and do a little bit of just about everything, but you have to have the depth in some area as well. It's not important for everyone, but when you start thinking about design systems and other new areas, I encourage you to, to think about if that's the candidate for your depth area, and to then use that as a springboard to, to looking backwards. So design systems is a great example because I don't know how design systems function without strong information architecture. How does it doesn't work? It's all IA in many respects. So that's, that's my long-winded answer. And I'm not sure I really gave you the answer you needed, but thank you. And by the way, if you're nervous about asking a question, geez, I mean, if you're doing it in a language other than your own language, my hat's off to you. I admire that. So thank you for indulging me in my English centrism. I think we have time for no more? No more. Okay. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you, Lou. Thank you so much.